Good afternoon. I'm joined today by Professor Stephen uh, Paus, uh, National Medical Director of NHS England, and Sir Albon, who is the Chief Executive of the Health and Safety Executive. First, I want to update you on the latest data on the coronavirus response. 2,007,146 tests for coronavirus have now been carried out in the UK, including 85,293 tests carried out yesterday. 226,463 people have tested positive. That's an increase of 3,403 cases since yesterday. 11,605 people are currently in hospital with coronavirus, up from 11,465 the previous day. And sadly, of those tested positive for coronavirus across all settings, 32,692 have now died. That's an increase of 627 fatalities since yesterday. This is, of course, devastating news for families across the United Kingdom. And we all need to stay alert and control the virus. I just want to remind people of the details of the next phase of our fight against coronavirus that we set out this week. If we turn to the first slide. In order to monitor our progress, we are establishing a new COVID alert level system with five levels, each relating to the threat, uh, to the level of threat posed by the virus. The alert level will be based primarily on the R value and the number of coronavirus cases. And in turn, that alert level will determine the level of social distancing measures in place. The lower the level, the fewer the measures. The higher the level, the stricter the measures. The social distancing measures remain critical in our efforts to control the virus. Throughout the period of lockdown, which started on March the 23rd, we have been at level four meaning a COVID-19 epidemic is in general circulation and transmission is high or rising exponentially. But thanks to the hard work and sacrifices of the British people in this lockdown, you have helped to bring the R level down and we are now in a position to begin moving to level three in careful steps. As you'll see on the next slide, we have set out the first of three steps we will take to carefully modify the measures, gradually ease the lockdown, and begin to allow people to return to their way of life, but crucially, whilst avoiding what would be a disastrous second peak that overwhelms the NHS. After each step, we will closely monitor the impact of that step on the R and the number of infections, and all the available data, and we will only take the next step when we are satisfied that it is safe to do so. Step one, from this week, those who cannot work from home should now speak to their employer about going back to work. You can now spend time outdoors and exercise as often as you like. You can meet one person outside of your household, outside, provided you stay two meters apart. Step two, from June the 1st, at the earliest, as long as the data allows, we aim to allow primary schools to reopen for some pupils in smaller class sizes. Non-essential retail to start to reopen when and where it is safe to do so. Cultural and sporting events to take place behind closed doors without crowds. And then step three, no earlier than July the 4th, and again, if only the data says it is safe. We aim to allow more businesses and premises to open, including potentially those offering personal care, such as leisure facilities, public places, and places of worship. Many of these businesses will need to operate in new ways to ensure they're safe, and we will work with these sectors on how to do this. As you'll see from slide three, Having taken the first step in carefully adjusting some of the measures and our advice to people on what to do, we have also updated our messaging. We are now asking people to stay alert, control the virus, and save lives. 
Yes, staying alert for the vast majority of people still means staying at home as much as possible. But there are a range of other actions we're advising people to take. People should stay alert by working from home if you can, limiting contact with other people, keeping distance if you go out, two metres apart where possible, washing your hands regularly, wearing a face covering when you're in an enclosed space where it is difficult to be socially distant, for example, in some shops and on public transport. And if you or anyone in your household has symptoms, you all need to self-isolate. A slide four shows, if everyone stays alert and follows the rules, we can control coronavirus by keeping the R down and reducing the number of infections. That is how we can continue to save lives and livelihoods as we begin as a nation to recover from coronavirus. And to underpin this in the workplace, we have published new COVID-19 secure guidance on working safely, available to UK employers across eight work settings, which are allowed to be open and where their employees cannot work from home. This also includes guidance for shops which we believe may be in a position to begin a phase reopening at the earliest from the 1st of June. Firms, unions, industry bodies and the devolved administrations have all fed into this guidance to give businesses and their employees the confidence they need to work safely. And I believe we have reached a consensus in doing that. We've also worked with Public Health England and the Health and Safety Executive to develop best practice on the safest ways of working across the economy. The guidelines outlined practical steps for employers to take, including carrying out a COVID-19 risk assessment in consultation with employees or trades unions. A downloadable notice is included in the documents which employers should display in their workplace to show employees, customers and other visitors that they have followed the guidance. We've also provided practical steps for employers to consider, such as putting up barriers or screens in shared spaces, creating fixed teams or partnering to minimise the number of people in contact with one another, and frequent cleaning of work areas and equipment between uses to reduce transmission. To support employers and employees through this, the government has made available up to an extra £14 million for the Health and Safety Executive, equivalent to an increase of 10% of their budget. This is for extra call centre employees, inspectors and equipment if needed. We also know how important the job retention scheme has been in helping businesses through this difficult time. And today, the Chancellor has announced a four-month extension of the scheme to help provide certainty to businesses. To date, seven and a half million jobs have been furloughed protecting livelihoods across the nation. Until the end of July, there will be no changes to the scheme. Then, from August to October, the scheme will continue for all sectors and regions of the UK, but with greater flexibility to support the transition back to work. Employers currently using the scheme will be able to bring employees back part-time. And as the economy reopens, we will ask firms to start sharing with government the cost of paying people's salaries. To be clear, the same level of support of 80% of people's current salary, up to £2,500, will continue to be met, but through a shared effort between employers and government. We will be setting out more details on the changes before the end of the month. Throughout this pandemic, I have been struck by the way people have looked out for one another. These measures are produced in that spirit. So to employers, I say, use this support and guidance to know you're doing the right thing and work with your unions and workers to keep each other safe. And to workers, I say, we are looking out for you. We want you to feel confident that you are financially supported and returning to a safe workplace. Because in this time, like no other, we all need to work together safely as we rebuild our economy. Thank you. Steve, could I ask you to take us through the rest of the day's slides, please? Thank you, Secretary of State, and good afternoon. 
So as the Secretary of State has said, it's critical that we all continue to comply with the rules around social distancing as we move into this next phase. The benefits of doing that have been clear uh, and are shown in the data slides which I'm going to present this afternoon in an updated format uh, to the format that you have previously seen. So the first slide uh, looks at uh, social distancing and how compliance with those social distancing uh, rules has uh, been uh, undertaken by the, by the public. Uh, the chart, uh, which is data from the Department of Transport, uh, shows data uh, reflecting uh, the use of transport, both public transport and private motor vehicles. And as you can see, as you've seen before, uh, we are still seeing reduced levels uh, of usage, particularly of public transport. Uh, in the chart, in the slide also is some data from the Office for National Statistics, Opinions and Lifestyle Survey. Uh, this survey taken uh, in this data from the latter half of April, showing, for instance, that 44% of employed adults are working from home compared to 12% last year. 82% of adults only left their home for permitted reasons, if at all. Uh, and 92 per cent of adults avoided contact with vulnerable people. So a high level of compliance with the social distancing rules. And going forward, it's critical, as I've said, uh, that we continue to comply uh, with the social distancing rules that we are asked to comply with. The next slide is data on uh, testing uh, and new cases uh, within the UK. The top chart shows daily tests, which has increased uh, uh, over the last few weeks uh, towards uh, capacity, of, capacity above 100,000. Uh, and the daily confirmed cases shows the number of positive cases that are being detected in that testing program. And as I've said before, the number of daily confirmed cases is remaining static, and that is good news in the context of an increased capacity and increased number uh, of tests, and suggests that we are seeing uh, a stable level or a reduced level in, in proportion of the confirmed cases as respect to testing. The next um, slide shows uh, data on deaths. Of course, every death is, is a great tragedy and my heart goes out to the friends and family and loved ones of those who've died. This shows uh, daily deaths uh, from, uh, in all settings, uh, of those who have tested positive the key thing here is to look at the seven-day rolling average. The data does uh, vary from day to day, particularly as we come out of weekends when there is a reporting lag. But you can see on the seven-day rolling average that the number of daily deaths uh, is reducing. The next slide is data from the Office for National Statistics. And this uh, shows deaths where uh, coronavirus was confirmed or suspected. So this is not just cases where a te or, uh, individuals where a test has been positive. This is also uh, inclusive of uh, people where in the death registration process, a, sus a suspicion of COVID-19 has been included uh, in, in the registration. Uh, this is uh, very uh, latest data, uh, I think that was uh, published today. There is a, a lag on it, goes up to the 1st of May. Uh, but this uh, again shows the additional uh, deaths that are, uh, can be included uh, when you look at suspected cases, not just test uh, confirmed cases. And in the bottom chart, you can see how that is changing over time in the ONS data. And you can see uh, that in the settings of hospitals in particular, and, and now in care homes, we are seeing a, a reduced number of deaths, a falling number of deaths that are either confirmed by uh, positive testing or suspected uh, and noted in the death certificate. In the next um, slide, we're now moving on to hospital data. Uh, so this is data uh, in the top chart from NHS England and in the bottom chart uh, from all four nations. And this is uh, showing the estimated admissions with coronavirus into uh, English hospitals. You can see in the top chart that that number has been declining uh, since the middle of April. And again, that is a reflection uh, on the fact that we are all complying with those social distancing measures. And that in turn is translating into a fall in the most critically ill patients, those individuals who unfortunately require care in our critical care facilities. And you can see that in all four nations in the bottom chart, 
uh, the proportion of patients in critical care uh, has been reducing and that trend uh, is uh, reducing uh, quite consistently now over time and that is also reflected in the absolute numbers uh, of uh, patients in critical care beds uh, with uh, COVID-19. Uh, and then finally, in the next slide, uh, broken down into countries and regions uh, of England, uh, this is the number of people in hospital with COVID-19. So currently 11,605, that's a reduction from 13,606, so a reduction of 2,000 uh, over the last week. Uh, you can see that reduction has been most marked in London, uh, but it all is also uh, uh, now occurring in uh, other regions uh, in England and in uh, the other UK devolved uh, administration. So again, uh, this reflects uh, the success of the social distancing measures uh, and all our compliance uh, with those measures. And in order to ensure that these trends continue to, to be downwards, both in hospital admissions and in deaths, it is critical uh, that in the various phases uh, of uh, coronavirus, we comply with those social distancing instructions that we've all been given. Thank you. Great, Steve, thank you very much. Uh, let's move to the questions. So I think the first uh, question from the public is from Hannah in Rosendale. I would like to know if the UK government have considered universal income for UK residents of working age. Considering that the furlough scheme has cost such a large amount, plus an increase in those seeking benefits, is implementing something that is not means tested at least being discussed? And is it something that is on the cards as a future solution? Uh, well, Hannah, thank you very much for that. So I think the first thing to say is that, um, you know, there is an enormous amount of support uh, that the government is providing to businesses and individuals. Uh, earlier today, the Chancellor, of course, announced an extension of the furlough scheme, and that will provide a huge amount of reassurance. Uh, I think what's very important in the way that we provide support, particularly more widely in the welfare uh, uh, system, is that we target it at people, and um, you know, universal basic income is an issue that's been uh, tested in other countries and uh, hasn't uh, been taken forward. Right, the next question is from Alan uh, in uh, Newcastle. Uh, if I read, Alan, do we have your question? Alan from Newcastle asks, after already surviving intensive care and ventilation from COVID-19, I ask what plans do the government have for clinically vulnerable members of the population once the 12 shielding weeks have ended on the 15th of June? Um, I think the first thing to say is that we need to do everything we can uh, to support individuals and we have set out uh, the measures that we require for people who are shielding uh, and indeed in the, the workplace guidance we have produced we have also uh, looked at vulnerable groups. But I wonder whether Stephen you might want to uh, take this question on further. Yes, well the first thing is to, is to say how pleased I am Alan that you have, uh, you know, fortunately you appear to have caught uh, COVID-19 but you have got through hospital and through uh, intensive care and ventilation and uh, I'm sure you will be grateful to all the NHS staff who managed you through that illness and I think it's particularly important to recognise their contribution especially today uh, because today is the International Day of the Nurse it's 200th uh, anniversary of Florence Nightingale and um, I think it's uh, a really important day for us to recognise all the work our nursing colleagues have done uh, to, to manage you and and all the patients uh, who've come through our NHS facilities uh, needing uh, care uh, because they have caught uh, COVID-19. Uh, I'm, sure, I'm sure you would want to say that. Um, in terms of going forward, it, as you know, uh, we have asked uh, the particular groups in our population who are at highest risk uh, from coronavirus. So that, that is in particular those uh, with uh, conditions that put them at risk, so people with cancer, uh, people with uh, organ transplants because they have drugs that suppress their immune system, uh, people with severe uh, lung conditions such as cystic fibrosis. So, so for that group that we are shielding uh, and have asked for 12 weeks uh, to uh, stay at home and avoid uh, all possible contact, uh, I think it's been really important that during uh, the, the first, the, the peak of this uh, virus uh, in April, uh, that we have protected uh, those uh, particularly vulnerable uh, members of the population. We will need to continue doing that uh, as we get through the next uh, few weeks. Uh, I think uh, clearly uh, that will need to be kept under review. 
Uh, but I think it's really important uh, to say that we are not through this yet. Uh, the virus is still circulating. It is reducing in the population. The R number is below one, and we intend to keep it that way. But while it is in the community, uh, clearly uh, those at highest risk are still vulnerable. Uh, and I think we would all want to make sure that we do everything we possibly can uh, to protect them. So it's very difficult to predict what will happen over the next few months, but I think the key thing is that while the virus is still circulating, uh, we all have a duty to ensure that we do all we can uh, to keep uh, those at highest risk safe uh, from this virus. Great, thank you, Steve. And just to add, Alan, I, I know it'll be very difficult for, for very many people who are being shielded, who are not able to see members of their family. It is difficult, but this is about protecting them, and this is ultimately about saving lives. Um, I think we'll move to the, the journalist questions. Um, Simon Jack from the BBC. Simon. Simon, we can't hear you. You may be on mute. I, I, someone would do that for me, how wrong I was. Um, as business secretary, you know that some businesses simply cannot op operate economically viably under social distancing rules. For example, hospitality, many of them are predicting zero income this year. You're asking businesses to start to contribute towards the furlough costs after July. What happens if they can't? So, Simon, what I would say is that, um, uh, firstly, uh, I think the, the, the furlough scheme extension has been really welcomed by uh, businesses, by uh, employer organizations, by trade unions, and I think that's right. And it's given people reassurance that actually they're going to be secure financially. And I'd just say that, uh, you know, it will have been eight months from March until October where we've provided that security, and that's been absolutely the right thing to do. Um, the Chancellor said that he will set out more details later in the month on this issue, but I think for now, what businesses will be very pleased with is that they've got certainty, which is something that I know they've been looking for, and certainly all the conversations I've had, uh, I know that they have welcomed this, uh, this change. Yeah, Would you like to follow up? Yes, yeah, just quickly. Um, it's, over, it's an enormous intervention, probably the largest single intervention the government has engaged in. You're paying the wages of over 7 million people. The government's conceded that not every job can be saved, and that's true of these 7.5 million jobs here. Do you acknowledge that there are hundreds of thousands, potentially over a million people, who are effectively now unemployed but just don't realise it yet? Well, I think it will depend on uh, the support they're providing overall and how quickly we can come out of this particular situation. Uh, I mean, the reality is the reason we have provided this support, and so we're talking about uh, the grant schemes that have been operating, almost nine billion pounds, over nine billion pounds now paid out, uh, the support that's provided through the um, bounce back loans, through the um, uh, other extensions and loans that have been put in place. Um, the reason we have done all of that is precisely so we can keep people in roles, in their workplace, so that when we come out the other side, we're able to bounce back. Uh, of course, uh, as the Chancellor has also acknowledged, we're not going to be able to protect every single job. But I think by any international comparison, the fact that we're supporting 7.5 million people for the furlough scheme uh, should be something that uh, you know, should be universally welcomed. Thank you, Jack. Simon. Um, right, I think we move to uh, Paul Brandt, ITV. Paul. Yeah, thank you. Business Secretary, I want to ask you about care homes, most of which you'll be aware are businesses and, and therefore do actually fall under your remit. They're telling us tonight that many of them are on the brink of closure. In fact, one is closing its doors this evening because of the financial pressures of COVID-19. Care homes say there isn't enough funding. It's not getting through to them. So what more will you do to help keep them open? So um, thank you uh, for that question, uh, Paul. Look, um, I think it is a difficult time for business. Uh, I completely understand that. And you know, every day I talk to businesses, I talk to business organizations, uh, and we are listening very hard and we are providing that support. Uh, the Chancellor today has announced his extension of the FOLA scheme, which will help uh, all businesses, it'll help care homes. Uh, and indeed, you've also seen uh, the uh, increase in terms of the loans that are being provided. So I'll give you some statistics in terms of the bounce back loan scheme. Uh, the cumulative value of the approved facilities is over eight billion pounds. The coronavirus business interruption loan scheme, uh, uh, over six billion. Uh, so there is support that we are providing uh, and we will continue to do that. And what I would recommend to any business is to have a discussion with their banks and see whether they are going to be eligible uh, for the support that we have provided. 
Would you, you like just to come up? back? I mean, many of the schemes that you mentioned aren't really relevant to care homes. They don't need to furlough their staff. They need their staff more than ever. And it's not as if business is being interrupted by COVID-19. If anything, they are just desperately trying to get through this pandemic. They're busier than, than ever. So I just ask you again, I mean, are there any extra measures that, that the government will be coming up with specifically for care homes to help make sure they don't close? Well, I think what we're doing in terms of supporting care homes is also ensuring that we get uh, PPE to them. We're also making sure that we are able to provide uh, testing through mobile testing to support uh, staff and also those who are in the care homes. And we will continue to do that. And of course, we keep all our policies under review. But what I would say to you again is that if you look at the measure of the support that we have provided to business uh, by any international comparison, uh, it really is very, very favourable. Thank you very much for that, Paul. Uh, let's move to Ben Kentish at LBC. Ben. Thank you. Good afternoon. Secretary of State, the mortality rate for people in their 60s, in their 50s, sorry, is more than 20 times higher than that of people in their 20s. And yet when it comes to the advice you've issued about going back to work tomorrow, it applies the same to everyone under the age of 70. Why, despite the very different risks, have you took a, taken a, a blanket approach? And are you asking employers to take into account, in conjunction with workers, those sorts of risk factors like age when deciding who should go back to work and what roles they should be doing? And if I could ask a, a related question on those statistics, it's just over a month since government scientists predicted that a death toll in this first wave in the UK would be somewhere between 7,000 and 20,000. The figures released this morning suggest that excess mortality in that period has surpassed already 50,000. Do you think that initial modelling was flawed? And if not, are you able to say a little bit about why you think that figure is so much higher than that predicted by members of SAGE last month? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ben. Well, let me, let me take the question on, on workplaces, and perhaps, Steve, you might want to take the second part of the question. Um, just in terms of workplaces, uh, look, I mean, absolutely every single uh, death, every mortality that takes place, whether it's in the workplace or elsewhere, uh, is uh, completely uh, uh, something that we would definitely absolutely not want to happen. Uh, and uh, it is a tragedy. Um, but what I would say to you is that that is precisely why we have worked to produce the workplace guidance that we have done. And we've done that through a process of consensus. Uh, we've talked to over 250 stakeholders as part of that process, and that's involved the devolved administrations, the unions, uh, workers, uh, business representatives, uh, businesses, and we have come up with a, a set of proposals which is a framework to support businesses across the UK. And it is absolutely the case that absolutely every single workplace has a duty to keep their employees safe. And that is why we have uh, made it very clear that we want people to undertake uh, COVID-19 risk assessments uh, and to make sure they involve their employees uh, as part of that process and to involve unions if they are unionised. And it's also the case that, and I might ask Sarah to come in on this point, is that um, if an employee feels unsafe, um, they should uh, talk to their employer. And if that doesn't produce a result, they should, of course, contact the health and safety executive or indeed their local authority. Uh, and we have made sure that we are providing additional funding to the HSE for precisely that reason. Sarah, do you want to take that particular point before we go back to Steve? Sure. I think um, the thing to be really aware of in conducting risk assessments is an employer needs to have regard to the um, evidence and the, the scientific information which has been given by government about the different cohorts of people and their individual vulnerabilities. So as you'll be well aware, the government has described effectively a group of people who are so vulnerable that they're in the shielded category and who are asked to remain at home. Then there are a second category of people who are because of their clinical personal situation, more vulnerable should they contract coronavirus. And they've been asked to be particularly scrupulous in following the social distancing guidelines and the other guidelines. And in conducting a risk assessment, an employer needs to have regard to those things and also then to trying to ensure that those employees that it has who are in the more vulnerable category but who are still working are facilitated to be particularly scrupulous in following all of those guidelines, and that should form part of their risk assessment. Clearly, things about different cohorts of people who have different vulnerabilities is under constant, re constant review by SAGE and the other scientific 
advisors. And in the event that a different group is discovered to be more uh, vulnerable and those recommendations change, then we would expect employers to keep that risk assessment up to date and to make appropriate arrangements for their employees. Great. Thank you for that, Sarah. Uh, Steve, do you want yes. to take the second part of the question? Uh, so, uh, thank you, Ben. So, so, on the question of age, uh, as you uh, rightly have uh, pointed out, uh, the severity of uh, the way this virus affects people does increase with age, including, unfortunately, the risk of death. Uh, in fact, it increases through all ages, and it's at its very highest uh, in our most elderly uh, members of the population in their 80s and 90s. But I think it's important uh, to say that it's not just age. Uh, there are other risk factors as well, including existing uh, medical conditions, obesity, uh, you will have heard us uh, talk about too, uh, and unfortunately ethnicity, which again we are, we are looking into. So I think uh, it's not a single risk factor, as, as is often the case, it's looking at those risk factors uh, in the round. And of course that's exactly the reason uh, that we have asked the most vulnerable, the highest risk members of our population to shield, uh, as I described in response to uh, to Alan's question uh, from Newcastle. Uh, so uh, I, I don't think it's um, sensible just to simply look at a single risk factor. Uh, it's important to look uh, at, uh, at the range of risk factors. And on the question around uh, the predicted number of deaths, uh, in, in fact, the original reasonable worst case scenario that was produced by SAGE predicted around half a million deaths, so a very large number of deaths uh, that were likely to occur uh, if no action was, uh, was taken uh, to try and uh, control uh, the spread of the virus. So the fact that the social distancing measures were introduced in March has meant that the peak uh, that we saw in April uh, is, is many, many thousands of deaths below that, that original reasonable worst case uh, scenario. Uh, and I think that shows how effective those measures have been. And clearly going forward, what's important uh, is that the measures that are put in place avoid that second peak. That was one of the five tests, of course, the government has set. And it's by keeping the R number, as you know, below one, that drives down uh, the rate of new infections in the population, uh, and that in turn drives down the number of hospital admissions and deaths. Uh, but it was a very large number of deaths, 500,000, that was originally modelled in the original reasonable worst case scenario. Great, thank you for that, Steve. Uh, let's move to Nigel Morris at the I. Nigel. Um, good afternoon. Uh, Business Secretary, you say to Britain's workers that we're looking out for you. So could you help me with the scenario of an unscrupulous employer dragging staff back to work before their workplaces are truly safe for them? Under those circumstances, do workers have the right to and receive some support uh, in terms of wage subsidies from the government. And I've also got a question for Professor Powis. Um, NHS guidelines, which were set out last month, um, relating to relatives being there at the death of a loved one, pretty vague. Basically, it's left to individual trust to decide. Shouldn't this area be revisited to give close relatives the guaranteed chance to say goodbye to their loved ones under these circumstances. Great. Nigel, thank you very much for that. Um, look, I mean, employers, as I've said, have a, uh, a duty to keep uh, their employees safe in the workplace. Uh, that is absolutely enshrined in law. Uh, and, of course, if somebody feels that their workplace is not safe, uh, they have to take that up with their uh, employer. Uh, and of course, if they don't feel that they are uh, uh, getting any traction there, they absolutely should get in touch with the health and safety executive or the, the local authority. And indeed, in the guidance that we have produced, uh, we have set out how they can get in touch with the HSC, either uh, uh, by email or indeed by phone. Uh, and the HSC will absolutely take action. I'll ask uh, Sarah if she wants to comment further, but that will include spot checks on uh, employers as well. But what I would say to you is that I have uh, obviously been conducting a, a lot of discussions in the preparation of this guidance. And what has struck me particularly is for the very many employers that are still open, where they have people coming into the workplace, they have worked incredibly collaboratively with trade unions, with employees, to keep their employees safe. Uh, and I think you know, it will be a very, very small number 
uh, of uh, workplaces where people may feel like that. But of course, if they do, uh, they can follow through and action will be taken. Sarah. So, um, as you say, Secretary of State, I think it's important that uh, employees do try to um, solve things with their employer if they possibly can, but we absolutely recognise that there will be some employers who don't do the right thing or don't know what the right thing to do is. Um, and there, uh, we absolutely are there if people want to contact us and to make a complaint. People have, of course, been contacting us already because many businesses have been working throughout this period of lockdown. And actually, our experience so far is that it's, it's rather more that employers haven't understood the right thing to do than that they're deliberately trying to do the wrong thing. And in the vast majority of cases, when our inspectors have got involved, employers have been only too willing to do the right thing. And we've been following up every time an employer has told us they've made changes and they've made an improvement to the workplace, not only with the employer to ask them to show us what they've done, but with the original complainant to check that they are now satisfied that their employer has done the right thing. And in the absolute vast majority of those cases, um, employers have made the right decision, have done the right thing to the satisfaction of their employees. There are a small number of cases where we're continuing to pursue that further, and we will certainly take enforcement action if that's required. Great. Thank you, sir. Steve, yes, second part of the question. Yes, so thank you, Nigel. So I know just how hard and heartbreaking it is for relatives who have not been able to be with their loved ones uh, at the time of death. I you can't imagine how hard that is. And as you, you rightly said, we issued guidance a number of weeks ago as we were going into to this epidemic uh, to restrict visitors uh, to hospitals. And I think it was important that that, that was done uh, because it's really important that we, we protect uh, everybody uh, from this infection, particularly uh, as more and more people were coming into hospital. Uh, of course, it's right that local organisations have done some discretion uh, in certain circumstances. Uh, we can't produce guidance that fits all circumstances and all uh, situations. And even within a hospital, uh, there will be areas which are harder uh, to allow people into than other areas. Uh, I'm sure that guidance will evolve over time as we come out from the peak and we get into uh, lower rates uh, of um, infection within hospitals. Uh, but what I can say is, is for all our NHS staff, uh, they will find this hard too. Uh, they will absolutely uh, want relatives uh, as much as possible to be with loved ones. Uh, and I'm sure going forward, local organisations uh, will be thinking about how within the guidance uh, they can do as much as possible for relatives. Great. Thank you very much, Nigel, for those questions. Uh, I think we now turn to um, Alex Morales at uh, Bloomberg. Alex. Um, Secretary of State, thank you very much. Um, you, you've mentioned several times that you're working very closely with the unions, um, and your government now needs the goodwill of those unions to encourage people back to work. As a gesture of good faith, would you drop a commitment in your manifesto to restrict the actions of unions? And a second question for Sarah Albin, if I may. You mentioned enforcement on employers. What penalties are at your disposal um, if employers don't comply with, with the requirements to carry out a risk assessment and don't make their workplaces safe? Great. Um, Alex, thank you for that. Um, what we are focused on right now is working collaboratively uh, across the piece, whether it's with unions or indeed employers or employees, to provide the support uh, that families need in this country, that businesses need, so they can be uh, in a position where they can bounce back uh, once we get back to, to normality. Uh, and that work will continue. Uh, as I said, uh, in terms of my own interactions with the unions, I have a regular dialogue, uh, and um, you've seen the response that they've provided both to the workplace guidance and indeed to the job retention scheme. And this is a collaborative effort, and we will continue to take this as a collaborative effort. And as we look to produce uh, safer working guidance for um, other workplaces which are not currently open, uh, my commitment is very clear, is that I want to continue to work with all parties, and that absolutely includes the unions as well. Steve. I don't think I've got anything nope. to add on that. I, please. Do you want me to come on the second mm, question? Please. So um, there's a range of different penalties that uh, are capable of being taken. So the uh, inspectors can require businesses to do certain things, enforcement notices, so requiring them to, to take particular kinds of action. In the most extreme circumstances, if there is a, a risk of serious injury to an individual employee, they can issue a notice which prohibits certain activities from taking place. 
and um, breach of those kind of uh, enforcement notices is essentially a criminal offence and we can prosecute people who fail to do the right thing. Alex, thank you very much. So you had a comeback? Follow up, please. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so, um, Secretary of State, does, does the um, manifesto pledge to, cr to crack down on the powers of the unions stay in place? Well, Alex, as I said, what I am focused on right now uh, is making sure that we get through this particular uh, um, uh, pandemic to make sure we provide the support and work collaboratively. Uh, and frankly, uh, that is across the piece. Uh, all colleagues in government are doing that. Uh, the, the Prime Minister, uh, the, uh, the First Secretary, absolutely everyone is focused on working together. And uh, let me give that commitment. I will certainly continue to be doing that with the trade unions. Thank you very much. Um, so I think the final question is from Matthew Lodge at the Lincolnshire Live and Lincolnshire Echo. Matthew. Thank you, Secretary of State. Uh, the loosening of lockdown restrictions allows people to drive to other areas for outdoor activities and to sunbathe on the beach. Uh, a number of people from the Lincolnshire coast have told us they are worried about this new guidance will, and that it will lead to an influx of visitors, exposing them to a greater risk of infection. Uh, but they will also see minimal economic benefit of this as hospitality and tourist accommodation businesses um, will largely remain closed. So firstly, what is the panel's message to people who do plan to travel to our coastal areas and to the residents of those areas who fear they will be exposed to greater risk? And secondly, can the panel give any clearer indication on when hospitality businesses in tourist areas might be able to reopen and whether there'll be any additional support provided to them, whether this be before the uh, lockdown is over or after they're back up and running? Uh, great, Matthew. Thank you very much uh, for that question. And of course, I think as the Prime Minister said, uh, we are taking uh, baby steps rather than giant strides in terms of the way we go forward. We're being cautious. Uh, but of course, what we have said to people is that they're able to now uh, travel. Uh, but we also made very clear that this is not about um, going and staying uh, somewhere overnight. Uh, and we've also been very clear about how they should interact with people outside their household uh, as well. Um, what I would say in terms of the hospitality sector, um, look, I know it, this is actually very, very difficult for hospitality, leisure, uh, parts of the retail sector. This is really very, very difficult. And that's why one of the first things that we did uh, was to ensure that we provided a uh, one-year rates holiday. Uh, we've also made sure that we're providing support through grants. Um, almost over £9 billion of grant support has gone out to uh, small businesses. Uh, and, uh, of course, we will continue to do uh, and have a look and see you know, how we can support businesses. But you have to look at the full measure of uh, uh, interventions that we have put in place. Uh, and as I say once again, by international comparisons, that is incredibly favorable. In terms of when we open hospitality businesses, which I think is the, is the, is the point you were making, I think what we all understand is that we absolutely want to avoid a second peak. You know, people across our country, in Lincolnshire, across our country, have worked incredibly hard to make sure that we manage to suppress the, the R factor. Uh, and that is so vital. And I think people do understand that across the country. Of course, uh, you know, it is very difficult for businesses, very difficult for individuals, but people do recognize that we need to continue to do that. Uh, and I'm confident that people will do that. Uh, and if we're able to do that, then of course, we'll move to a phase where we're able to open uh, some of those businesses. But I think the worst possible thing for business would be, right now in terms of confidence, in terms of uh, future openings, is we allowed the R factor to rise, and as a result of that, we had a second peak. So I'd just say in conclusion is that we know that it is difficult, but that is why we are providing the support, that is why the Chancellor has put forward the support that he has done, and of course I will continue to talk to uh, businesses in the hospitality, hospitality and leisure sector, as we, as we go forward uh, and, and see whether we can try and provide uh, and make sure that they're getting that right level of support in terms of schemes that we have in place already. Uh, I don't know, Steve, whether you wanted to mention the R factor and well, the, the science behind this. Well, well, simply as I've said before, that in all parts of the country, it's important that uh, compliance with social distancing uh, rules, whatever phase we're in, uh, is... is uh, complied with in order to ensure that the transmission rate is kept low and the rate of infection is declining and not, not rising. Because if it does rise below uh, above one 
for a sustained period of time, it will put pressure on health services. I know, I know the health services in Lincolnshire, and I know the particular challenges of health services in a predominantly rural and very spread out community. I visited uh, Pilgrim Hospital in Boston not so very long ago, and I taught staff there. I know under normal circumstances the particular challenges they have uh, in healthcare. So I think it is absolutely critical uh, that we keep this uh, virus under control. Uh, and, and finally, to pay tribute to all the health and care staff in Lincolnshire, who I know have been doing a magnificent job uh, in very challenging uh, circumstances uh, in that particular setting of, of a mainly rural uh, part of the country. Uh, they've done an absolutely wonderful job, and it's all our responsibilities in keeping the R below one uh, to ensure that they can continue to do that, that great work and not come under uh, increased pressure. Great. Well, thank you all very much. Uh, we've come to the end of this press conference. Uh, and can I just reiterate once again, uh, thank you for everything that the British public is doing to make sure that we suppress this virus. Uh, and the key message going forward is stay alert, control the virus, save lives. Thank you.